Welcome to the Ford Presidential Library. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as the director of the library here in Ann Arbor and also the museum in Grand Rapids. Welcome on behalf of my boss, the Archivist of the United States, and especially welcome to the first of our fall 2018 program series. It's really, really nice to have a full house again and to be back with you with a, with a special speaker. Tonight's program is brought to you with the support of the National Archives and Records Administration and the Ford Presidential Foundation. For those of you who are members of Friends of Ford, we really appreciate your support because it is those contributions which make possible programs like this. We are very, very pleased to have with us Lisa McCubbin to speak about her brand new book about Betty Ford, which is the first in-depth biography of Mrs. Ford since she passed away in 2011. The book was released just yesterday, so this is stop one on a book tour. So I think this is a first for the Ford Presidential Library to have an author on the very first stop on the tour. But before I go on to talk more about Lisa and the book, I'd like to introduce a very special guest we have with us tonight, someone who assisted with arranging some of the interviews for this book and who also has a rather notable background. With us, we have Clint Hill, who was a US Secret Service agent from 1958 to 1975. He served five presidents, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. He was in the motorcade in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. And he was the person you have seen leaping on the back of the limousine. Clint is in the back row, far corner. Please take a bow, and thank you for your service. We're really glad to have this partnership. Uh, uh, we've got a, a good twosome working with us tonight. So tonight we're going to be hearing from Lisa McCubbin, who is an award-winning journalist and the author of not one, two, three, or four, but it's four New York Times best-selling books. She collaborated with Clint Hill to write the powerful memoir, Mrs. Kennedy and Me. And I have to say that long before I knew Lisa or Clint, I have a well-worn, well-thumbed copy of that because I've used it as a resource for some of the talks that I've given about presidents and their use of Camp David and other aspects. So it's a really interesting read and I recommend it very highly. That book was followed by three more also drawing on the presidency and the ties with the Secret Service. These are Five Days in November, The Kennedy Detail, JFK's Secret Service Agents Break Their Silence, and then Five Presidents, My Extraordinary Journey with, again, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. In 2017, uh, there's a, a, there was an acquired acquisition of the television rights for Five Presidents, so stand by for more news about that. And in addition, National Geographic is currently developing a television series called The White House Detail, which will also be rather interesting when that comes forward. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Lisa's new book about Mrs. Ford, which began with research here at the library about two years ago. Uh, she also has spent a lot of time at the museum. And then there's been a lot of long distance follow up with our archival staff, Stacy Davis and Elizabeth Druga, who are here tonight, and our curator, Don Holloway, at the museum. Lisa conducted a total of 75 in-depth interviews, including all four of the Ford children and many, many other people who knew Mrs. Ford throughout her life. The book also includes extensive interviews with people who worked closely with Mrs. Ford, including Secret Service agents, and also a number of very interesting, never-before-seen photographs shared by the Ford family. So as we continue in this 100th year of celebrating Betty Ford's birthday, it's a real pleasure for us to, to welcome Lisa McCubbin to the Ford Library stage to talk to, to us about her new book. Lisa. Well, hello, thank you. It's so nice to be back here in Ann Arbor where this all began, as Elaine said, two years ago. Um, and I was going to thank all of the same people that you just thanked, so I won't repeat it, but I'm indebted to everybody here at the library, and I'm thrilled that Clint Hill is here with me as well. Um, so let me just tell you first, when I started this project two years ago, I really didn't know anything about Betty Ford other than 
She was a first lady. She started the Betty Ford Center. And um, that was about it. So I was starting. And, and in order to write this book, I knew that I had to be passionate about the subject matter. Um, so when, when it was first brought to me, the, the idea to do this book, I went on a long walk. And I live in the San Francisco Bay Area in this little village. And you know, just went on a walk to collect my thoughts and think, you know, do I want to do this? Well, on that 45-minute walk or so, I must have run into about five people wearing University of Michigan sweatshirts. <laughs> and I saw a car go by with a University of Michigan license plate. And I took that as a sign. <laughs> That was the first of many signs, um, which I talk about at the end of the book as well. So let me tell you what I discovered about Betty Ford. And, oops, oh, it is slow. OK, hopefully I didn't jump too now. Um, oh, yep, hang on. I'm, I'll get the hang of it. OK. Um, Betty Ford was born Elizabeth Ann Bloomer on April 8, 1918. This is a picture of her with her mother, Hortense, in Denver, Colorado. So Betty was the daughter of William Stevenson Bloomer and Hortense Bloomer. She was their third child. They had two sons already, um, Bill Jr. and Bob. And from the time she was little, everyone called her Betty or Betts. And this is a picture of her again in Denver with her two older brothers. She doesn't look so happy there, but who, who knows what was, what was happening. Um, when she was about three, the family moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, to this house at 717 Fountain Street. And I visited all of Betty's homes, um, which was really fun and important for me to just go and be in the places. Um, so this is where she said in her own memoir, this is where my memories began, was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And this is a photo of her when she was about three years old. Um, she was a little bit chubby. And when they moved to Grand Rapids, the family would go to a, you know, a, a cottage um, at Whitefish Lake. They rented this cottage every year. And Betty would wander around to the picnic tables of everybody's cottages. And people would give her cookies and brownies. <laughs> and she, she started getting chubbier and chubbier. And, so one day, her mother put a sign on her back that said, please do not feed this child. <laughs> so I think from then on, she probably was a little bit self-conscious with her weight because of that. So she grew up. She was a real tomboy with her. She had her older brothers. Um, this is a photo from Whitefish Lake. And that's Betty on the right-hand side. You know, She grew up fishing and um, just Back then, you know, kids wandered around. You left your parents. You wandered around with the other kids all day long. And then you'd show back up when the dinner bell rang. And um, there was a lot of creativity and just playing around. This is Betty with two friends at Whitefish Lake. She's the one on the left. And I love this because she's kind of going like this. And she has this playful personality. When I first met Susan Ford Bales, I asked her to tell me just the words that came to mind when she thought of her mother. And the very first word she said was, silly. <laughs> so I think this kind of shows Betty's silly side. And that's one of the things I tried to bring out in the book, is to show that silly side of her personality. This is their little cabin at Whitefish Lake. And this is Betty when she was about 9 or 10 years old. That's her father in the middle, William Stevenson Bloomer, and her older brother, Bill, on the left. Um, I didn't come across any family photos of the entire family. And actually, Elizabeth Druga, do you, are there any that exist of the entire family? Maybe one, but not a lot. Maybe one. I mean, so, and one of the reasons was Betty's father was a traveling salesman. He was not around a lot. And so Hortense was basically kind of a single mother. She raised the children on her own. Um, and William would travel for weeks at a time. Hortense would write him letters every day. Betty remembered coming downstairs, and her mother would have the light on writing her father a letter to stay in touch with him. Um, 
So she, ha she had a fairly close relationship with her father. When he would come home, he would always bring her something. So she had a whole stash of stuffed animals that her father would bring her. Um, but then it the depression hit, and a lot of people lost their jobs, and William lost his job. He had moved around from job to job. And there was a time period, it's not clear um, what was going on exactly, but Betty remembered that times got really tough. And when she was 16 years old, she came home to that house at 717 Fountain Street. And her cousin came running out of the house and told her that her father had been taken to the hospital. Well, as it turned out, some guests had come to visit her mother and father. Her mother went out to the garage, which was in the back of the house, and found her father in the car, the ignition on, and no gas in the car. So it was never uh, formally said that he committed suicide, but that's what everyone suspected. And then when Betty went to the funeral, she's 16 years old, she heard whispers that her father had been an alcoholic. And that was the first she had ever heard of it. So that was a tough thing for her to go through. Um, like I said, she was a tomboy. This is a photo of her catching a football, and she's wearing this cap that was one of her favorites. She ended up getting the nickname Skipper because she wore that cap so much. And because she was such a tomboy, when she was about eight years old, her mother decided she needed some femininity, I guess, added to her. So she enrolled her in the Cala Travis School of Dancing. And Betty loved dance. She said, from the day she started, dance is my happiness. And she, um, she took every kind of dancing there was, whether it was ballet, ballroom dancing. She started off ballroom dancing wearing white gloves and those black patent leather Mary Janes. And the, the boys had to come across the room and ask the girl to dance. And she, she just loved every part of it. And she was very good at it. She actually studied dance a lot more than she studied her academic subjects. Um, her, her grades were, you know, maybe B's and C's, but when it came to dance, she had hundreds across the board because that's where she spent her time and that was her passion. When she was um, 18 years old, she got accepted, invited actually, to go to Bennington College in Vermont to a summer program to the Bennington College School of Dance. And it was about a, a six week program where she got to study with the founders of modern dance. And Martha Graham was one of those teachers. So this was an enormous thrill for her. Um, she danced day and night and was there with some great friends. And they just danced all hours and studied all hours and got to the point where at times they were so sore they couldn't go up and down the stairs. They had to slide down on their bottoms because their muscles were just so sore. But she loved every minute of it. And um, one of the fun things I had researching this, um, here at the library they have Betty Ford's personal papers and scrapbooks. And I found these notebooks. Um, she had a stack of these notebooks. And thank God she kept them. Um, and so here it says Betty Bloomer, Bennington College, down there, dance composition. And inside, this is one of them. This is her handwriting, Martha Graham technique. And you can see she just took very detailed notes. The most important point stressed by Mrs. Graham is you know, keeping your back straight. And she would study these every night. And um, I don't know how many of these there are, but there's like eight or 10 of them that she kept. And um, I just thought that was really fun to see her handwriting back then when she was 18 years old and how important this was to her. So when she was 20, she actually asked Martha Graham if she could come and dance with her at her school in New York. Now her mother Hortense had said she couldn't leave Grand Rapids until she was 20 years old. Well, right, right before she was 20, her mother allowed her to go. Martha Graham said, of course, you can come and study with me. And um, that was in 1938. And um, I think there's a price on here of it. Oh, yeah, it was $100 for the um, entire session of dancing. 
but uh, Hortense paid that for Betty. And while she was in New York City, she got a job modeling as well. That was something she had done in her teen years. So she stayed in New York for about a year and a half to two years, dancing with Martha Graham. The thing about Betty was, though, she liked to have a good time. She was fun. Everybody said she was, she was silly and she was fun. And dancing required her to be very disciplined, not going out on dates with boys in the evening. And she wasn't really willing to sacrifice her social life for dance. And so finally, she realized she was not going to make the number one team with Martha Graham. She had been accepted uh, for the auxiliary group, but she didn't make the first string as it was. Um, and then after about a year and a half, her mother convinced her to come back to Grand Rapids. She said, please, Betty, just come back for six months. All your friends are getting married, and you, know, you don't want to be an old maid at 22. <laughs> and uh, and, um, and so, so Betty said, OK, mother, I'll come back to Grand Rapids for six months, but then I'm going back to New York. Well, Hortense knew what she was doing, and Betty never did go back to New York. But it was quite independent of her, I think, at 20 years old, in the 30s, to go to New York City by herself. I, I find that admirable. So when she went back to Grand Rapids, she became the Martha Graham of Grand Rapids. She then became an instructor at the Calla Travis School of Dancing. And she would um, teach all the young girls and put on presentations. And she loved designing the costumes as well. When she had been a teenager, she had worked at Herpelsheimer's department store. Does that name ring a bell with any of you? Yes. <laughs> um, it's no longer there, I guess, but it was an institution in Grand Rapids. And so then when she came back, she got a, another job at Herpelsheimer's and as a fashion coordinator. And uh, so she would um, work at these teas, Saturday afternoon teas, where they would do fashion shows and she would bring out the models and explain what they were wearing and say, um, that's on the third floor, just $29.95. <laughs> and um, so she loved that. And then she, she did also continue doing some modeling. These are some modeling poses that she did for her Herpelsheimers. And her, you know, her dancing, you can see, she just had that poise from being a dancer. So, she was, she was beautiful, she had a great figure, and she was outgoing, great personality, um, just a lot of fun. Well then, while she was back in Grand Rapids, she did get together with a boy. She did a lot of dating. As uh, her brother said at one point, um, there were always boys lined up for her. She ended up falling in love with Bill Warren. Bill Warren was a boy that uh, she had actually dated in high school, and they went to a dance together, and he left during the dance to go out in the parking lot and have a couple beers with some boys, and he came back in, and she slapped him and said, you will not treat me like that. I don't ever want to hear from you again. And she just couldn't believe that a boy would leave her alone, and that was not going to be her kind of boy. Well, several years later, she ends up marrying him. It would turn out to be what she would call the five-year misunderstanding. <laughs> so they got married in 1942. This is a, a picture a little bit after that. But um, he was tall, blonde. I think she had a penchant for tall, blonde men. Um, and he turned out he was a lot like her father. He was a traveling salesman. He was gone a lot. They ended up moving around from job to job. Um, she stops shy of saying that he was an alcoholic or that he was abusive to her, but it seems that there was, that was probably what was going on. And after five years, um, they got divorced, which now this is in the 40s. And I mean, this was a pretty brazen thing for her to do. She got $1 in the settlement. So here she was, um, now a divorcee, and she decided she was done with men. She was not ever going to get married again. And that's when Jerry Ford showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so Jerry Ford um, had seen Betty at some dances, 
and uh, he thought she was beautiful, and he convinced some friends to uh, give him her phone number, or give, give, yeah, give him her phone number. She called him up, or he called her up one night, and um, said, come meet me for a drink. Well, her divorce wasn't quite yet final, and she said, I can't do that. That's just not cricket. And he convinced her, come on, let's go out. I'll take you out to a place, and we'll sit in the corner, but I really want to have a date with you. So she said, all right, I'll meet you for 20 minutes. Well, they ended up staying for an hour, an hour and a half. And about six or eight months later, they were married. <laughs> they fell madly in love. Now, when Jerry proposed to Betty, he said to her, we can't get married right away. We have to wait until the fall. And they ended up getting married in October of 1948. And he said, there's a reason we can't get married to the fall, but I can't tell you why. Well, she said, yes, fine, doesn't matter. She trusted him, whatever. He must have had a good reason. Well, a few months into the engagement, she found out the reason that he was keeping it till fall was that he decided he was going to run for Congress. So he finally told her, he said, I'm planning on running for Congress. And she said, she didn't know what running for Congress meant, but if he wanted to do it, that was fine. <laughs> and so she went through the whole campaign with him and got caught up in it. She really didn't think he was going to win because she thought Congress was only for old gray-haired men. But of course, he won. And two weeks after their marriage, they were in Washington, D.C., because back then, congressmen actually moved to Washington, D.C. with their families and lived in Washington, um, something that has changed. But they, and then they would end up being there for the rest of their career. So when Jerry won the seat for the 5th District of Michigan, as you all know, and when they went to Washington, he was saddled with $7,000 in campaign debt. But they were young and love, happy, and um, they moved into an apartment. This is at one of their apartments in Park Fairfax. Um, they wanted children right away because when they got married, Betty was 30 and Jerry was 35. So, you know, they were already getting on up there um, in years when it comes to having children. So Michael was born on March 14th, 1950. And Jack was born almost exactly two years later on March 16th. And Betty loved being a mother. Um, she was fortunate, though, in that when Mike was born, they hired a woman named Clara to come and help. And Clara um, became part of the family. So Betty would go to Congress and try to learn what Jerry was doing. She was very interested in his work. Um, and Clara would help take care of the kids and do the housework. And, um, the thing about Clara, when I interviewed each of the four children, I asked them about Clara. And all four of them, as soon as I mentioned her name, they choked up. And um, Mike said, when I asked Mike for it, I said, tell me about Clara. And he kind of gulped and he said, how much time do you have? When I asked Susan, tell me about Clara, she got teary-eyed and she said, she was like a second mother. She was my mom when my mom wasn't home. Clara was an extremely important part of the Ford family. They were all very close to her. So after they had two children, um, there were toys everywhere in this tiny little apartment. And um, Betty said, Jerry, if you're going to keep running for Congress, it looks like we're going to be staying here in Washington, and we need a bigger house. So they built this house at 514 Crown View Drive in Alexandria, Virginia. It was the second house in the neighborhood. This was a photo taken in 1955. Um, there's still some construction materials there. So I think that was right around when um, it was first built and when they moved in. It was a four bedroom house, um, a nice size yard, about seven minutes from the Capitol. And um, this is where they would raise their family. So after Mike and Jack, then Susan and Steve came along. Um, Steve was born in 1956, and Susan came the summer of 1957. Here they're seated around their kitchen table, and notice the, the wood paneling there. In this house that they built, they were able to customize some things. 
and they wanted some traditions from their Michigan roots. So the, they brought in wood paneling and all the cabinetry was from Michigan. Um, a lot of the furniture was Michigan made and that was very important to them to have that sense of their roots. So Betty was at this point, she's a congressman's wife. Um, yes, she was a housewife, but she had a lot of responsibilities as well. Um, she was running you know, different groups with, with the congressman's wives. She was a Cub Scout den mother. She was a Sunday school, teeper, Sunday school teacher. Um, she coordinated fashion shows for the Congressional Wives Group. So she had a lot going on. Four busy children, three of which were boys, all playing sports, very active. Um, and around the time that Susan was um, six years old, five or six years old, Betty was reaching across um, the kitchen sink to open up a window, probably to yell at one of the kids in the back for you know, doing something. And she was tensed up, she reached over, and the next morning she woke up and she could barely move. She was in such pain. Jerry had to rush her to the hospital and the doctors diagnosed it as a pinched nerve. She was in traction in the hospital, um, just excruciating pain and they gave her some strong prescription painkillers. She was in the hospital for a couple of weeks, and when she was getting ready to leave, she was so worried, she asked the doctor, well, what do I do if the pain comes back? You know, if, I, if I'm out somewhere and the pain comes back, and the doctor said, well, don't let the pain begin. You take your pain pills every four hours. And so that's what she did. She took prescription strong painkillers every four hours to make sure the pain didn't come back. And by the way, he, the doctor didn't tell her that uh, it wasn't a good idea to have her evening vodka tonic while she was on these pain pills. So that habit continued. That's where it started, was the prescription medication. Every year the family took Christmas photos. There's um, and they would send them out as Christmas cards. So there's a nice record of their family growing up with all their Christmas photos. And uh, this is just one of them. They love to ski. Jerry learned to ski when um, he, was, he was young and he wanted his family to learn to ski as well. So they would go skiing at Boyne Mountain in Michigan and they would go up there ever at Christmas time because that's when the kids had time off school and he had um, time off from Congress. So they would go um, almost every Christmas. And uh, until one year, a friend invited them to go out to Vail. And once they went to Vail, and there was a lot of snow, they didn't go back to Boyne Mountain. <laughs> So along with skiing, um, you know, I said the boys uh, always did a lot of sports, and Betty was well known in the ER in Alexandria, Virginia. They said they, knew, they thought something was wrong if Betty Ford wasn't there at least once a week with one of the kids. But um, that was, again, one of the things she dealt with as a mother while Jerry was traveling for Congress and, um, and all of that. She it was around this time as well. She, um, she was, you know, had her pinched nerves. She was in a lot of pain a lot of time. And she started feeling depressed. She, she just realized, you know, Jerry's moving up in Congress and he's getting all these accolades and I'm home doing all this stuff. You know, what about me? And this was a common phenomenon at that time um, for women trying to figure out, you know, is there more to life than raising children and doing everything for your husband and your family. And Betty was, having been a working girl, um, having been a career woman, um, she, she started getting depressed and she went to see a psychiatrist. And he really helped her a lot. Um, he also put her on Valium, which again was something, it, in that time it was the most commonly prescribed medication in America. Um, millions of American women were on Valium because they 
were not happy, they weren't feeling fulfilled, and the Valium made everything okay. So, um, so Betty was taking Valium along with her pain pills, so that continued. In 1968, Richard Nixon and Vice President Spiro Agnew were elected, and they won again overwhelmingly in 1972. By this time, Jerry Ford was the minority leader in the House of Representatives, and he had aspired to be Speaker of the House which of course could only happen if the Republicans could get control. When that didn't happen, he realized he couldn't foresee in the next four or eight years that it was going to happen. And he realized he probably wasn't ever going to be Speaker of the House. So he promised Betty that he would run again one more time in 1974, and then in about 1975, he would retire, and um, they would move back to Grand Rapids and he would get a nice job as a lawyer, and they would finally be together. She'd have her husband back home, and he made this promise, and she could hardly wait till that happened. So then, of course, we know what happened. Agnew ended up resigning, um, and so Jerry Ford had to appoint a vice president. Um, now, Betty did not think that Jerry was going to be appointed vice president. There were about 10 names on the short list that were being swirled around. And she said, you know, Jerry's just too important in the House. There's no way Nixon would want him as his vice president. And besides, he's promised me he's leaving politics, so there is no way this is going to happen. She was firmly in denial. Um, so much so that when the announcement was about to be made, she and her daughter, Susan, made a $5 bet. And Betty said, I bet you $5 there is no way that he's going to be it. And Susan said, I think Daddy's going to be the nominee. Well, Susan won that bet. <laughs> so this was when um, Jerry was sworn in as vice president in December of uh, 1973. And he brought Betty up there and he kissed her passionately and I love the expression on the look of his face. I mean, this was something you didn't do. You didn't kiss your wife passionately in public, but um, they had a wonderful relationship. Jerry was very proud of Betty um, and he liked kissing her in public. He had no problem with that at all. So now he's vice president. So the Secret Service comes in, and they had to redo this little house. So remember, there was a garage in the front. Well, the garage became the Secret Service command post, and they put in that bay window. Um, they had to reinforce the driveway because they had the heavy cars that were going to be on it. Um, and at that time, actually, it was only Jerry that had Secret Service protection. Betty didn't have it. The children didn't have it. It was, it was only the vice president. Um, a few months later, as you'll find out in the book, Susan got protection before her mother did. Um, and there were some funny incidents with that, with the Secret Service and um, a 16-year-old girl running around who did not want to have Secret Service agents following her. <laughs> so um, you, know, you all know the history. Um, Nixon ends up resigning. And on August 9th, 1974, um, Gerald Ford is about to become president, and they're walking out of the White House. Um, Nixon has said goodbye to all of his staff. Staff are all there. Clint Hill was actually there on the, on the grounds. He was the assistant director of the Secret Service at that time, and he witnessed this. And uh, Pat Nixon is saying to Betty, you'll get so you hate these red carpets. <laughs> and Betty said, that day was the saddest day of her life. She didn't want to be first lady. She had been looking forward to retiring, getting out of this, and now all of a sudden she is right there in the fishbowl, um, and she, she said, I'm not going to change. You know, this is, this is who I am. Um, and you can see kind of the look on her face there. She's, you know, trying to just pull it all together, but it was, it was overwhelming. It was really overwhelming for her. 
And here was his speech in the East Room. This is where the swearing-in took place. There was no inauguration. There were no inaugural balls. It just happened overnight. And um, about 200 people there witnessing the swearing-in ceremony. And so that night, they went back, or he went to work, and Betty goes back home to her house at 514 Crown View Drive. And that evening, they had some neighbors over. And Jerry walks in about 8 or 9 o'clock. And she's pulling a lasagna out of the oven. And she says, there's something wrong with this picture. You're president of the United States, and I'm still cooking. <laughs> So one of the things that I found fascinating was, oh, look, first this picture. This was taken right after the, um, uh, after the swearing in. They went up to the Oval Office and had a family photo taken. Um, that's Jack, Steve, Betty, Jerry, Susan, and Gail, who's married to Mike. So uh, Mike's wife, Gail, and then Mike Ford. They had the, that nice photo taken. And then they went back home. And, uh, they lived in their house at 514 Crown View Drive, Alexandria, Virginia, for 10 days while Jerry was president. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that, but it had happened so suddenly the Nixons didn't have time to move everything out, and so um, he would go to work every day for the next 10 days while they were getting everything um, into transition. So six weeks after Betty became First Lady, she happened to go to a doctor's appointment with her assistant, Nancy Howe. Um, Nancy had a scheduled gynecological appointment, and she said, Betty, you know, you've been so busy this last year. I know you haven't gone to the doctor. Why don't you come with me? You need to get checked out, too. Well, it was during that doctor's appointment the doctor discovered a suspicious lump in her breast. Now, he said, we need to get you into the hospital right away to check this out. And she said, oh, I've got a very busy day tomorrow. I can't do that. And they, well, actually, the hospital couldn't take her for two more days. But she did have a busy day. She was hosting uh, Mrs. Uh, Lady Bird Johnson and her daughters. And this is them showing her in the, the bedroom. They brought them over to the White House to show them what they'd done at the White House. And you'll see there's a suitcase at the end of the bed, Betty had her suitcase packed to go to the hospital that night. She never mentioned anything to the Johnsons about what was about to happen. And the, the normal procedure at that time was they were going to do a biopsy. And they put Betty under general anesthesia. And they're doing a biopsy. And they would then test it. And if it came back that it was fine, OK, she'd wake up and she would go home. If it came back malignant, while she was under general anesthesia, they would remove her breast. So she went into the hospital not knowing, A, if she had cancer, and B, if she was going to come out um, missing a breast. So it did turn out to be um, cancerous. And Betty said, you know, so many other women are going through this too. It's not just me. We came into the White House and we said we were going to be transparent. It's not going to be all these secrets like there were before. And I want everybody to know what's going on. So they put out a press release and said that the First Lady has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, um, many of you can remember this time. People that are in their 20s and 30s, they can't even imagine this, but you couldn't say breast. Most people didn't say cancer. You would whisper, he has cancer, she has cancer. You wouldn't talk about it. Um, you couldn't say breast on television. So when, it, when Betty Ford came out and said she had breast cancer, it literally changed women's health care overnight. Women were lining up at their doctor's offices at clinics to go and get their breasts checked. There were, uh, in newspapers, they had diagrams of breasts showing women how to check their breasts. It was just amazing. 35,000 letters came into the White House while Betty was in the hospital of men, women, children expressing their gratitude to her for bringing this out in the open 
and helping them know how to deal with this. Either they had dealt with it or um, men, th their wives were dealing with it. And they were very proud of President Ford for the way he was supporting his wife and um, just being open and talking about it. It was really remarkable. And Betty was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and one day she surprised Jerry as he was coming to visit her. He walked out of the elevator and she was walking around. He said, Betty, what are you doing? She said, I'm doing fine. You know, she was doing all of her exercises and everything and she was up moving around. Well, he had brought her a present that day and it was uh, a football that had been signed by the coach of the Washington Red Redskins and the entire team. They had won the game the previous week. So he handed it to Betty and then they start walking back to her room and she said, hey, turn around. And she threw the football and th with her right arm, she had had her right breast removed. David Kennerly caught the moment, of course. Um, he was right there. And that photo then was in newspapers and once again telling women all across America, you know, breast cancer, if you have that diagnosis, it's not a death sentence. Um, look at me. We're going to get through this. So she was really remarkable. And that, um, that December, she was on the cover of Newsweek called Free Spirit in the White House because she was so outspoken. You mentioned Camp David. The family loved to go to Camp David. It was a place where they could just relax. And this is just them uh, goofing around, Susan playing around with her dad. Uh, just a very playful photo. And um, here's one with Liberty. They actually, David Kennerly and Susan um, brought Liberty to Betty and Jerry as a present um, when Betty was in the hospital. And it was kind of to cheer up Jerry Ford while Betty was in the hospital. And, um, and then Liberty was their cherished dog. This is a photo of the family at Christmas time in Vail. And um, you can see they're just like any other family. They're very unpretentious, um, opening up their gifts. And Betty loved her, her robes. She had beautiful bathrobes. And a lot of times she would stay in her bathrobe till 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, even in the White House. Um, I was with Susan Ford Bales last week, and she, we were talking about her mother's bathrobes. And she said, do you know, after she died, we went through her closet, and guess how many robes she had. Anybody want to guess? 32? 100? 93. She had 93 robes in her closet. So Susan kept a couple. They gave some away. I don't know what happened to all of them. <laughs> so um, when Betty Ford recuperated from her, her breast cancer surgery, she realized the impact that she had had on women. And she, it was kind of like a light bulb went off and she realized the platform that she had at First Lady, the good that she could do to um, talk about things that she cared deeply about. And one of those things was the Equal Rights Amendment. She was a staunch supporter of equal rights for women. And this was not really very popular in her husband's um, administration. They didn't really want her talking about this as blatantly as she was, but she felt very strongly because she had been a homemaker, she had had a career, and she felt like women should be able to do whatever they wanted, they should get equal pay for equal work, and yes, it needed to be an amendment, but they needed 38 states to ratify it in order for it to pass. And at that time, they were about five states short. So she got on the phone. She started calling congressmen in various states, um, telling, her, telling them that they really needed to support this bill. It needed to pass. And um, all of a sudden, there were protesters outside the White House that the First Lady was supporting this cause and using taxpayer money to make these long-distance phone calls from the White House so she said, fine. She put in an outside line and paid for it herself. And so she wasn't using taxpayer dollars to make those phone calls, but she continued making those phone calls.
The Equal Rights Amendment did not pass and still has not passed. Um, and that's something I think we need to work on and Betty would be proud of us if we all supported her. <laughs> so a year after um, she had become First Lady, she agreed to do an interview with 60 Minutes. It was her first television interview. And I'm gonna play a little piece of it for you. And as you're watching it, I want you to remember this is 1975. And, um, and kind of think about, can you imagine if this reporter were asking today's First Lady or Michelle Obama these same questions? It's kind of interesting. Politician. Well, a year ago this weekend, Jerry and Betty Ford found themselves in the unsought position of President and First Lady. When we went to the White House to chat with Betty Ford, we expected to find, quite honestly, a rather bland and predictable political life. We found instead an open woman with a mind of her own, prepared to talk about anything, no taboos. I told my husband, if we have to go to the White House, okay, I will go, but I'm going as myself, and it's too late to change my pattern, and if they don't like it, then they'll just have to throw me out. Among the things you haven't spoken of about are abortion, which is kind of a taboo subject for, for the wife of the president. It's one of those well, things that... Well, you ask a question, you have to be honest exactly how you feel. And I feel very strongly that it was the best thing in the world when the Supreme Court voted to legalize abortion and, in my words, bring it out of the backwoods and put it in the hospitals where it belonged, I thought it was a great, great decision. You've also talked about young people living together before they're married. Well, they are, aren't they? <laughs> Indeed they are. Well, what if Susan Ford came to you and said, Mother, so I'm having an affair. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I would think she's a perfectly normal human being, like all young girls. Um, if she wanted to continue it, I would certainly counsel and advise her on the subject. And uh, I'd want to know pretty much about the young man that she was planning to have the affair with, um, whether it was a worthwhile encounter or whether it was going to be one of those She's pretty young to start affairs. Do you think Betty Bloomer would have been the kind of girl who would have at least experimented with marijuana when you were growing up? Oh, I'm sure I probably, when I was growing up at their age, I probably would have been interested to see what the effect. I never would have gone into it as a habit or anything like that. It's uh, the type of thing that young people have to experience, like your first beer or your first cigarette, something like that. I think everyone would be fascinated to know what is the issue that you, where you sat Terry Ford down and said, listen, I want you to listen. Well, a lot of it had to do with uh, perhaps putting um, a woman in the cabinet. Um, you won that one. Yes, I won that one, and I'm working on another. <laughs> I'm on the bench, then I think that I'll really be, uh, have accomplished a great deal. <laughs> so, isn't that fabulous? <laughs> well, not everybody thought that that was so great. Um, there. 60 Minutes got loads of responses of letters. The White House got letters, most of them appalled at what the First Lady said. One of the letters, um, I'm going to read it to you. At the top it says, from Maria Von Trapp, Stowe, Vermont, August 12, 1975. So this is just a few days after the, uh, this aired. Dear Mrs. Ford, you may have noticed what an outrage was raised all over the country by your flippant remark on television. By way of introduction, I want you to know that I am the real Maria from The Sound of Music. As such, I am very much in the limelight. All during the summer, people come in busloads from around the country to meet me, take my picture, and to get my autograph. I only say this 
that you may understand that I really meet hundreds of people every day, and I can assure you, you have done great damage to your husband's political aspirations. Both of you have lost a great deal of respect and goodwill among the people of the United States. But aside from all this, do you realize how much harm you have done to the American family and to the American youth? I pray that God will give you the necessary insight. Then please, Mrs. Ford, have the courage to step before the camera again and try to undo some of the damage. If it comes from your heart, people will believe you. Sincerely yours, Maria Von Trapp. There were thousands of letters like that. There were also thousands of letters of support. People saying, yes, this is what we want to hear. This woman is in touch with the, with the modern age. Um, in the White House, um, Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney um, were more kind of like, maybe she shouldn't have said those things. And at one point, they went to President Ford and said, you know, could you please tell Betty she needs to just tone it down and be quiet, not talk so much. And President Ford looked at them and said, if you want to tell her that, go right ahead. <laughs> and I, I happened to actually talk to both uh, Mr. Rumsfeld and <laughs> Vice President Cheney. I saw them uh, last summer at the commissioning of the USS Gerald R. Ford, and they both said, Yep, that really happened. That's exactly what happened, and neither one of them went up to her. <laughs> Betty was going to do what Betty was going to do, and, and uh, Jerry loved her for her outspokenness, and he wasn't about to stop her. Um, one of the things in the White House was uh, parties became a lot more fun than they had been in the Nixon administration. <laughs> um, Betty, of course, loved to dance, and so... Um, it became really a coveted invitation to go to the White House, and there was always dancing. And um, usually it was President and Mrs. Ford who were the last ones to leave. They, they loved to dance. And during the bicentennial, um, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip came to the White House, and um, the Fords hosted them. And here's a classic photo of Mrs. Ford dancing with Prince Philip at the White House. So now during the 1976 campaign, um, you know that President Ford had pardoned Richard Nixon, and that hung over his head. Um, people were still upset about that. But by this point, Betty Ford's approval ratings were higher than her husband's. And so she was sent out campaigning. Um, now, mind you, remember, she still has this excruciating pain. Um, she's uh, doing all of these things as First Lady, all of these requirements that, um, that she's required to do. And, there were, and she had just recovered from breast cancer. So there were times when she was um, really stressed. And the assistants around her, people that I talked to, said they felt that she really was pushing it too hard. People were asking way too much of her, but she rarely said no, and she would just go out there and do it. Steve Ford um, rented a Winnebago and went around the West campaigning for his dad, and this is one of the stops where Betty joined him. So the whole family really got involved, and even though they hadn't wanted to be in the White House in the first place, they realized, you know, Betty actually realized she enjoyed it. And she had blossomed during this time period. She, she found that she was getting attention, the attention that, you know, she really hadn't the rest of her life, and she liked it. And she was making a difference. Um, she, she got to see her husband a lot more. And so she wanted him to win. Everybody wanted him to win. They thought he was doing a good job. And so they all went around and campaigned for him. So when he lost, it was a, a devastating blow. Um, and as you all probably know, President Ford lost his voice in the last days of the campaign. Um, he'd been out campaigning for weeks and months. And so to give the concession address, he asked Betty if she would step forward and speak to the press, which she did. 
And, um, you know, that was a pretty courageous thing to have to do. And you could see the looks on everybody else's faces. They're just devastated. And Betty was able to hold it together. Her, she had this philosophy of, you know what? It happened. It's in the past. Let's move on. She just wasn't going to sit there and let it bother her. And this photo kind of says that. They wanted an, one last family photo of all of them in the Oval Office like they had had that first day. And um, this is Betty. Everybody's kind of moping around, and Betty says to Jack, come on, chin up. This isn't the worst thing that can happen in life. We're all here, and we're moving on. And uh, David Kennerly said this really epitomizes the kind of um, attitude that Betty had for everything that she did. So they, they stayed in the White House then until um, January 20th when Nixon was to be, in, or not Nixon, sorry, Jimmy Carter was to be inaugurated. And um, the last day, their last full day in the White House, January 19th, 1977, Betty was wandering around saying goodbye to all of the staff, and David Kennerly, the photographer, was with her. And they walked by the cabinet room, and... Uh, <laughs> She said, you know, David, I've always wanted to dance on the cabinet room table. <laughs> and he said, he said, you know, we had a, there was another photographer there, and nobody thought she was serious except David Kennerly. He goes, I knew she was serious. And he said, well, Mrs. Ford, this is your last chance. So she took off her shoes. She hopped up there and uh, very nimble and struck a pose and, um, you know, this is a, a classic photo. It wasn't released publicly until David Kennerly released his own book of photographs many years later. Indeed, Betty had forgotten that she had even done this because it, it really didn't see the light of day. But she struck that pose. And then when I was going through the photos, I found this one <laughs> that no one had ever seen before. It was in the, in the contact sheet. And... Um, that ended up being the cover photo for the book. Mostly because I wanted the other one, but it, the chandelier, and it was just too much going on, and the publisher said it didn't really work, so we found this one, and um, the staff at Simon & Schuster colorized it. So um, I got David Kennerly's permission, he, and he loves it. He loves the colorization, so um, that ended up being the cover of the book. And one of the reasons I love it is because it, it's kind of intriguing, first of all. Like, why is she sitting on the table doing this? And she just has this look on her face, like, you know, a little impish, impish grin. And that's kind of the way she was. So when they were leaving the White House, they decided not to move back to Grand Rapids. They decided to move to Rancho Mirage, California, um, they had gone out there many times, usually around Easter, to visit friends. They had friends out there in the desert. Jerry, of course, loved to golf. So um, they decided to build a house out in Rancho Mirage. And uh, so they moved out there. And this is a photo of um, Betty when they were moving into the house with her personal assistant, Caroline Coventry. And I interviewed Caroline um, at length. She was with Mrs. Ford for two years, and they were really the two worst years of Betty Ford's life. And, um, and Caroline was with her for this part. So think of this. She's been first lady. She's reached the pinnacle. She's as happy as can be. Now, all of a sudden, she's not. There are no more helicopters taking you everywhere. You're stuck in L.A. traffic like everybody else when you want to go somewhere. Um, all of her children are out of the house. Jerry... Um, wasn't a wealthy man when he left the White House, and he started going around speaking and getting paid for it. So he was on the road speaking. So she was pretty much alone out in Rancho Mirage where they had a few friends, but not real close friends. And um, all she had to do was work on this house. And uh, it was very, very lonely. It was at this time when she had been taking this medication for a very long time. Um, there, I have parts in the book where several of her assistants were concerned while she was in the White House, 
And then Caroline was deeply concerned after the White House at all the different medications Betty was taking. And the family started seeing a real difference in her. Um, it had just built up so much medication that she was taking herself, that all prescription medication. And then in the evening, she had a nightly vodka and tonic. But that vodka and tonic was multiplied 22 times on top of all of this medication she was taking. So um, the family decided they had to do something or they were going to lose her. She had changed so much. So just a little over one year after they left the White House, um, they had just moved into their brand new home in Rancho Mirage. And this is the living room. They decorated around that big, beautiful painting of Betty Ford that was presented to her in the White House. And um, she loved the shades of blue and white and green. And uh, they gathered in this living room. And there she is looking over them. When they confronted her, um, she didn't know it was coming. She was, it was in the morning. She was wearing one of her robes, a pink robe. Everybody would remember that pink robe. And um, it was a very painful experience. Took a lot of courage for the family to do what they did. But they knew that they had to do something or they were going to lose her. Um, in fact, the, the name of the, the chapter of the intervention is, we're doing this because we love you. And that's what they kept saying over and over. It came from um, a feeling of love. And at the end of the intervention, um, Betty agreed she had a problem. And there were just a couple of places available for her to go to. And she agreed to go to the Long Beach Naval Hospital and go into a month of treatment. There were no Betty Ford centers back then. So she was there with all these sailors from the Navy going through treatment. And she was the first lady. When she first walked in, there was a room with four beds. So she had to share a room with three other people, which she wasn't happy about at first. But they forced her to do that. And in the end, she realized that that was a good thing. They weren't treating her like a first lady. They were treating her like an addict, like everybody else. So a year later, um, uh, there was an intervention with a neighbor of theirs, Leonard Firestone. And Leonard Firestone came out of recovery, and he was a new man. And he said, you know, Betty, the two of us, we, we can do something together. And she agreed. They raised a lot of money, and um, they were went around. They had to change some laws in California, get um, certain things done. And, and Betty worked tirelessly to get this done. And then they came to her and said, you know, we want to call this the Betty Ford Center. And at first she said no, she didn't, she didn't want to put her name on it. The reason was in the back of her mind, I mean, she's still fresh in recovery. In the back of her mind it was, if I put my name on that center, I can never have a drink again. And that's exactly why she put her name on the center. And, it, and um, she never did have a drink again. The Betty Ford Center, this is the groundbreaking ceremony. That's um, Dr. Joe Cruz, who was instrumental. That's Betty Ford and Leonard Firestone on the right at the groundbreaking ceremony. And um, then one year later, on October 3rd, 1982, the Betty Ford Center was opened. Has an equal number of beds for women as for men. It is the only... Um, addiction, alcohol and addiction treatment center in the world that has the same number of beds for women as for men because Betty said uh, she always wanted enough beds to be there for the women because women ha are just as likely to have this problem as men. They're just not as likely to go and get treatment. Um, the Betty Ford Center is known for treating celebrities. That's what you hear about. But in reality, only 1% of their patients are celebrities. 99% are um, housewives, truck drivers, politicians, um, world leaders. And to this day, they will never um, acknowledge anybody having been there. Everybody is anonymous. Um, you know, I asked them about names that we've heard, you know, Elizabeth Taylor and Liza Minnelli and 
they themselves have come out and said they had been to the Betty Ford Center and nobody at the Betty Ford Center will confirm or deny that any of those people have been there. So um, discretion is, is a huge part of their program. <coughs> In 1991, Betty Ford was given the Medal of Freedom. This is um, by President George W. Bush. And um, she's done, she had done so much for so many people. On December 26, 2006, her beloved Jerry Ford died. And this is at his funeral. She slept with that flag on her pillow for the next five years. She missed him terribly. She loved dancing with the stars. Her granddaughter told me that's what she did for entertainment. But from the moment Jerry left her, she just felt like there was no reason for her left to be here. And she kept saying she just wanted to go and be with her boyfriend. Five years later, on July 8, 2011, I get choked up because I love Betty. Um, she passed away. And on July 14th, what would have been President Ford's 98th birthday, Elizabeth Ann Bloomer Ford was laid to rest in the tomb alongside her husband near the Gerald Ford Presidential Museum in Grand Rapids. And as family and friends mourned the woman they loved and admired, amid the grief, there was joy. For no one doubted that Jerry and Betty were finally together again. I've said in the book that it is impossible to quantify Betty Ford's legacy or to overstate it. So many things we take for granted come as a direct result of her candor and courage. She made it okay to talk publicly about breasts and cancer, and by encouraging that conversation and then working tirelessly to keep it going, funding for research, education, and care has grown exponentially. Richard Norton Smith, the historian, said at her funeral, where women's health issues are concerned, American history is divided into two unequal parts, before Betty and after Betty. More than 100,000 people have been treated at the Betty Ford Center since 1982, and it has become the gold standard for treatment. Betty Ford was an amazing woman. And I'm honored to have shared her story with you. Thank you. So I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Um, there's a microphone back there. I would like for you to expand a little bit on your comments about Clara Powell. I love the story in the book where she and Betty are scrubbing the floor and singing together. Obviously a very close relationship with her, and certainly with the children since she was there their entire lives. Were the children at all conscious of that she was of a different race? Did that come up at all in any of their comments, any of the interviews? Was that ever expressed in any way by the Ford family? I mean, the, the marvelous acceptance uh, back then of more than just a housekeeper is terrific and yeah, certainly no, they, complimentary of them. But were the children conscious at all of that difference? No, they, they didn't notice color. She was, she was their second mother, and that was um, one of the great things um, that, the, that the Fords taught them, that um, you know, people are all treated equal. And um, she came to... Uh, you know, the, when Jerry was sworn in, um, she, was, she was a part of the family. She was there for the intervention. Um, it was very important for all of them to have Clara there. Um, she, no, they, there was no mention of, of race. In fact, I mean, they, they said that they just saw her as one of them. She was part of the family. Betty Ford's husband survived two assassination attempts very close to each other. I was curious if in those discussions about any insights or thoughts on how she reacted to those situations. Um, yes, and that's, it. that's in the book as well. Um, I actually 
interviewed Larry Boondorf, who was one of the Secret Service agents who, um, who saved President Ford by grabbing the gun. Um, she, from the, you know, she was, at, at one of the incidents, she um, was, they were in Palm Springs or Monterey, and she was flying up to meet Jerry up in San Francisco, and all of a sudden, um, the agent said, get her to the plane as quickly as possible. We're doing something different. Just get her there. Nobody said what had happened, so she didn't know. And um, she gets on the plane, and then, and usually the president is there first, but she, she was there, and he comes on, and she said, oh, Jerry, how'd they treat you in San Francisco? <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> let me tell you what happened. Um, so... Um, after that, she was very concerned, and she said she would have loved if he just didn't travel anymore. But um, there's a photo in the book of her standing on the balcony waving, and every time he left without her, she would go out there and wave, and she said a little prayer. Um, she was really deeply faithful, had a deep faith in God, and that's woven throughout the book as well, very apparent, both of them. Um, were, were deeply religious, and that got them through a lot of these tough times, really did. So, um, yeah, she was always concerned. And, um, you know, Steve Ford said to me, he, they hear it on the news, and actually the, his Secret Service agent came in and said, something's just happened, and he happened to be watching TV, and he said, you're about to see it. You're, there was an assassination attempt, but your dad's okay. And Steve said, you know, the world hears there's an assassination attempt on the president. I hear someone's trying to kill my father. So it's, yeah, it was very personal. Just a couple quick comments, if I may. When Betty Ford died, I was actually on vacation and stopped at the Bill Clinton Library. And remember, if you're a friend of Ford, you get into all the presidential libraries for free. <laughs> Anyway, there was a guest book there of condolences for Betty Ford, as I thought there would be. And the neatest part of that was the woman in charge of it was a breast cancer survivor who was very grateful for what Betty Ford had done. Yeah. And she was, that was just a neat experience. And if I can say something to Mr. Hill a minute. I've read your books. I saw you on C-SPAN, I think, at the Texas Book Fair a year or two ago. And uh, answering questions and everything, uh, your integrity just comes right out. And uh, thank you for everything you've done. One more before we go mm -hmm. sign books. Okay, let's thank Lisa. We okay. can talk in a while. Thank you. Thanks so much. so much, Lisa. Uh, the stories are, are wonderful, the photos are wonderful, and even for those of us who know a fair bit about Mrs. Ford, I learned some things tonight, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have lots to share. So I have the privilege of being the chauffeur. It's a new uh, feather in my cap. I'm the chauffeur tomorrow to the Ford Museum, so I'm looking forward to some wonderful time to spend with both Lisa and with Clint and uh, looking for more stories. But we thank you so much for, for your research here and, and with the interviews. And a set of pens with the signature, of, not Betty, sorry, we don't have those, but Gerald R. Ford for you to help sign your books. Oh, so thank you so much. Wonderful. So thank a pleasure. So a pleasure. So and thanks again, Stacy and Elizabeth, take a bow. These are the two archivists who did a lot of work to help with this book. They're, So before we go to the reception, I want to uh, add to the commercial that was just done. If you are a friend of Ford, hint, uh, for a mere $35 a year, seriously, uh, you're helping to contribute to programs like this, but also you do have a discount in our gift shop, which is very good. I'm a regular customer. And also you have free admission to all of the presidential libraries across the country. So it's a deal like no other. So I do hope you'll think about that. Um, also, if you're not a friend of Ford, but, but you would like to receive email notices of our programs, there are forms 
outside the left-hand door from the auditorium. You can fill that out, and we will send you uh, no notices of sales or discounts, but we will send you notices of upcoming programs. So please join that list. It's, it's a great service. And um, now we invite you to a reception. You'll have a chance to ask more questions of Lisa and or Clint and uh, enjoy some refreshments. And yes, there are copies of her book for sale and you'll find everything you heard tonight, but a lot more. So thank you for coming and we'll see you next time. Thank you.